thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, uh, I, I thought I should let you know that uh, the fourth candidate in this race, Rod Kemp, uh, has emailed us in the last hour to say that he unavoidably uh, had been summoned to a court hearing regarding a family member uh, and that the uh, that's something like this has never happened before, really, at least and not in my tenure. And so uh, we're going to proceed without him. But uh, but it sounds like he has a legitimate, plausible, uh, unavoidable excuse that was beyond his control. So <clears throat> I hope you can understand we may we may interview him separately. So we have your questionnaires and we know about the three of you. We want to know more and I'm going to just dive right in and uh, we're going to rotate and, and ask questions. If there's three of you, um, uh, you know, if 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 someone says something that you feel maybe has uh, personally directed at you and you want to respond, raise your hand, uh, try interrupt politely. It's OK with me. Uh, this is going to be a free flowing discussion. Uh, I want to start with. Uh, Actually, I'm going to give the three of you an opportunity to make a brief opening statement about yourselves and about your candidacy and why you feel you're the best candidate. And we'll just proceed in alphabetical order. And Daryl Campbell, you, sir, you have the floor. Well, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here to this, this afternoon. Um, well, uh, my name is Daryl Campbell. I'm a candidate running for state representative District 94. The reason why I feel that I I am um, the candidate for uh, to continue to represent the district is that um, I'm by trade. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I am willing and able to listen to issues on 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 that focus on our community uh, from our constituents. Um, I, I've been walking the ground and understanding what those issues are to our constituents as it relates to uh, mental health. Um, building our economy um, in the economic development and and also education. And so I want to continue carrying that message uh, to uh, the state capital. Um, I am focused wholeheartedly on representing my community and making sure that their voices get heard um, in moving forward. OK, thank you, Mr. Reglashaw. Good afternoon and thank you everyone for having me. Um, I was born and raised here in South Florida. Um, I believe out of all the candidates, I have the most deep rooted um, access to this community. Um, I was went to school here, knew went a product of Broward Park County Public Schools, excuse me. I went to Howard University and achieved a Bachelor of Science and matriculated to Nova Southeastern and have a Master's in Science in Public and Physical Therapy. I have owned and operated businesses in this district. Um, my family as well has over 30 years of public service to this district. And I have learned um, from my father and both my mother and several members of my family that have publicly served this district throughout those years on how to lead and to govern. And I plan on continuing that legacy through this district and providing leadership and stepping up and providing the leadership to this district that it, it definitely needs. Thank you. All right, Mr. Manley. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to the editorial board for having all of us here. Uh, my name is Elijah Manley, running for state representative here in District 94. I am also a product of this district. I went to the Fort Lauderdale High School, where I was a flying L for four years, and studied history at Broward College, soon to be an owl at FAU. Uh, I'm running for this office because I believe that I can deliver the results we need for District 94 in Tallahassee. We've been facing some deep rooted problems for the past two years, thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen a crisis with housing, we've seen a crisis with the environment, we've seen a crisis with our healthcare system. And we deserve someone in Tallahassee who know and understand these issues, uh, who've built a network. I've built a network of people um, who've mentored me over the past few years. That will be a, a piece of guidance in this district. So. I know this district, I've lived here my entire life. I've walked this district, I've lived here, I've grown here, I know people here, I know this district off the top of my head. I know that I'll be able to deliver the results we need in Tallahassee and I'm very glad to be running. All right, thank you so much for your uh, 
specificity and brevity, so it's always appreciated. This is a big job uh, with big responsibilities, and uh, you are a you're going, one of you is going to be a state representative looking out for the needs of the entire state. We at the Sun Sentinel expect people who run for the legislature. It's great that you're offering yourself for public service. You need to be prepared from day one, and you need to know what you're doing in Tallahassee. Mr. Manley, what is the difference between recurring and non-recurring revenue in the state budget? <laughs> Thank you. I know this question was asked to me last year as well. So uh, recurring, uh, a recurring budget, uh, those are revenues that we will expect every year to come in, whereas non-recurring revenue, non-recurring revenue uh, will not be coming in every year. Mr. Campbell, is he right? He is. Okay. Mr. Campbell, what's the approximate, I'm not asking for an exact number, but close, what's the approximate size of the current state budget? Uh, the current state budget is about $108 billion. $108 billion. Mr. Eglishan, is he right? He is not right. What is it? What's the right number? <laughs> He's a little over. I, I want to say it's approximately um, maybe 107, um, 107. I, I want to say 107. And I think on track this year, it should be, I want to say 99. Okay, I think you're pretty close. I think it's just under a hundred billion dollars. Yes. Uh, but but there's some fuzzy Great. math in there because of the uh, because of the federal federal money. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Campbell, uh, can you think of anything that Ron DeSantis has done well as governor of this state? <laughs> uh, you know what I would say as 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 it stands right now, um, you know. The thing that Ron DeSantis has done well is uh, uh, kind of carried a message of, ooh, that's tough. <laughs> he has kind of carried a message of, uh, um, you know, showing slight concerns here or there uh, about, um, you know, the people focused on COVID. Um, but there are obviously ways that we could have done better um, in, in focus on some of the issues within his stance uh, in addressing matters of COVID. Um, I would have definitely focused on more of adding more of a support for our, 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 our tenants that were uh, um, put on hold um, through this through this delay in the process. And so, um, yes, there, there, there are moments by addressing that there is an issue um, and and in, in COVID, but as far as his, his um, you know, some of the, the ways and the routes that he went about doing it, I think we should have done a lot better in that. Okay. Mr. Manley, the same question for you, sir. Something Ron DeSantis has done right. Well, I really can't find anything, Steve, that this governor has done right in the past two years. He started off a little well when he was first elected. He was tackling environmental issues. He was talking about bringing this state together. And over the past two years or so, he has ran to the far right, uh, capitulating to Donald Trump uh, and running for president. So I can't really find anything he's done. I mean, we've seen over 30,000 people die in this state due to COVID. We've seen, you know, tens of thousands of jobs be lost because of this governor. And instead of addressing this crisis that required leadership in this time, instead the governor decided to go on Fox News, attack the press, run for president, and pretty much marginalize our entire community. So I can't find anything this governor has done right in the past two years, but I still do believe that he has the time um, and the ability to do something right this next year, of this final year of his term. Okay. And, and Mr. Eglishon, the same question to you, sir. Um, I can't find many things that he's done right, but if I would have to put my finger on it, I would have to say his appointment um, to the North Broward Hospital District. I believe, uh, Shane, I think that's a good direction in that sense. I do like his stance and bringing uh, some tax dollars with the gambling. I, I like that and, and what it attracts to tourism to bring some money to the state that is needed. I like that aspect that he has brought, but other than that, um, I can't find many things that he has done well. Okay, okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. Daryl Campbell, uh, I noticed on your resume and in your questionnaire, you were both, you've been both a campaign manager and legislative aide to Bobby DuBose, who of course uh, is vacating this seat in the middle of his term. He resigned to run for Congress. 
uh, and so the seat is open. Uh, has Representative Bobby DuBose endorsed your candidacy? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I, met, I, I did not put that on the questionnaire because I thought you guys were asking for organizations. But yes, he is uh, currently endorsing my uh, my run for this office. What did you what have you learned uh, about how to be a good legislator from working for Bobby DuBose? Uh, well, one of the things I learned is that you got to learn to talk to the other side. Uh, when I'm when I'm in office, I'm definitely uh, reaching out to other uh, freshmen uh, Congress con uh, uh, legislators in, in ensuring that, uh, you know, start building that connection and starting to being able to get things done in office instead of keeping things at a standstill. What was it in your life or what 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 prompted you to want to pursue a career as a licensed uh, uh, clinical social worker? Well, my purpose has always been to help uh, one individual. And and so in finding my purpose and helping one individual, it just grown and expanded from one to two to three individuals, communities, families, and now, um, you know, working on policy level issues that are affecting these same individuals, these same communities and the same families. And so um, that that is what prompted me. And so that's what I, I plan to keep a focus of and, and what I plan to continue to do moving forward is make sure the community's voice is being heard. Tell us what the biggest, in your experience as a social worker, tell us what the biggest need is to continue to build strong families and and in, in House District 94. Uh, what's, well, what's missing? Well, the biggest need right now, is, and we're we're seeing glimpses of the people starting to stand up and and really highlight it is the effects of mental health. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, we're we're seeing individuals not put themselves first. They're putting every everything else first, their job, um, uh, other life situations that may be occurring um, first, rather than making sure they put themselves first. And so we're seeing. Uh, people are starting to leave jobs and they're they're really trying to look at what their mental health status is. And so for uh, for me, what I want to do is continue to ensure that we're we're uh, we're putting in policies that create services for individuals that need to, that's looking to seek out help um, and moving forward. OK. Uh, Joe English on the third, um, you're the son of a former legislator. Uh, I covered your dad for many years in the Florida House. Uh, and so I, it's an obvious question that I would ask you, what what lessons of life and political intelligence do you draw from being his son? Well, the environment has changed since he was in the legislature. Um, those days with Lot and Childs uh, has changed a lot. There was a lot of bipartisan relationships. You know, they didn't let the party rule things. And I think that's what's missing today. So what I've learned from him was, yes, you have to you know, relate to the other side, but you can't always vote for what the, what's, what the party is trying to hold you to. You're there to represent your district. And sometimes you have to do what's right. You have to do what's right for your district and you have to vote for what's right. And sometimes your party may want you to pass a bill that's not necessarily right and you have to to vote for things that are right and just you can't get caught up on party. So I, I've learned not to to get caught up on things and to just do things what's right for the community to always have to listen to your base and most of all to have faith and in and, and God. Um, I know my dad, you know, he prayed before every time he went on the floor and for me. I have that in my life and it's instilled in me. And those are the things that I've learned to just not to not be in touch with your base, to definitely always have a heartbeat on what your community wants, but to do what's right for your community. We have to okay. bring something back. Why is Tallahassee more partisan today than it was when your dad was in the house? Well, you know, things are different. Um, over the last years that you have, I mean, of course we've had the, the past two governors have been Republican, and that's when you see that, that there has been a change. And it's just people are caught up with this party. People are caught up with, you know, it's right ring for the Republicans. And, and we just have to get things done. We just have to come together and get things done. I have Republican friends, and I understand some of their issues. And I'm a Democrat, and I, 
I understand the issues that we have. And we can come together, or my friends can come together in the house and agree to disagree, but we have to move forward in the right direction for the people because we're just not doing this for a gas bag or just for the quote unquote clout to be a legislature. We're representing the people and we have to come together for that. Okay, Mr. Manley, you know, uh, I think you're the youngest candidate in this race, uh, but you've, you've been interested in politics and public service for a long time. I, I'd like to ask you um, to tell us about a Democratic, a Democrat, uh, in your party, somebody who you admire, someone you would emulate uh, in public office? That's a great question. There's so many to choose from, Steve, but I, I really think um, and, uh, that Anna Eskamani is uh, one of the best legislators we have in Tallahassee right now. Um, she leads by example. She does the work um, and she doesn't just do, uh, do that work during a session or, or during committee weeks. She's out in her community every day uh, fighting for her people. I mean, what she did this past year with the unemployment system, I mean, she helped people who didn't even live in her district. Um, and so if I'm sent to Tallahassee, I hope to learn from her, uh, to be like her, um, and to grow into a legislator who could be worthy of the shoes that she walked. I mean, there are others. I mean, Representative Alexander, who's incoming Democratic leader, is also great. He was my age when he first ran for office, so we share a couple of similarities. And when we talk, we talk a lot about, you know, what it means to be a legislator, what it means to serve your community. And so he's one of the people I look up to as well. But so I think him, uh, Representative Alexander and Representative Eskamani is uh, our two leaders. Um, everyone should strive to be in Tallahassee. OK, I think uh, Anna Eskamani, uh, somebody we know well, Anna Eskamani would would uh, would agree with my description of her. She's an unapologetic progressive. Yes. <laughs> would you identify would you identify yourself? with other progressives in the House if you got elected? I surely will. Uh, help me help me and others and others uh, um, on, on the board here understand that there's 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 certainly a very healthy attention in the Democratic Party right now that that some mainstream liberals think progressives are too liberal. They're too <laughs> far to the left. What, how would you respond to that? I don't think that is the case. I think we are seeing a change in politics. I think we've seen this change over the past. I mean, every generation there is a new change in politics. Um, and I think the party is becoming more left, but I think the, the party is looking at all of what's going on in our society over the past 40 years with the war on the working class, um, with the environment, with everything. And they're saying, well, gee, gee whiz, these issues don't seem as radical um, as they've been made out to be for the past few decades. Things like Medicare for all. Um, isn't as radical as it used to be. I mean, things like making sure that we have clean drinking water uh, coming out of our faucets every day. Um, these are not radical issues anymore. And I think a lot of people are waking up to that. And I do reject the um, the labeling that people in the public put on this um, in our party about this being divisive, uh, about this being a progressive versus moderate issue. I don't think that's the case. I think these are really healthy debates in our party. And I think, you know, all of us, we really share the same goals in the end, which is making sure that we protect our democracy. And in the end, we want the same things for our community. So I think progressives are so in, in a way saying some of the same things. And I think moderates have a lot to learn from us. We have a lot to learn from them as well. Um, but I think there is a, a realization in a party that the working class people, our base of our party um, has been neglected over the past few decades. And we are reclaiming that time. OK, I'm going to step back here and just open and I'll ask my colleagues, Dan Sweeney and Martin Blakeman, if they want to jump in with any questions. Yeah, uh, yeah I, uh, sorry, go, ahead. go ahead, Dan, I'll, I'll follow you. I, I, I actually just had a couple of quick ones just to clear up a couple of things that were on the questionnaires. Uh, Mr. Campbell, um, you didn't listen to list an address on your questionnaire and I'm I'm not saying anything about about you particularly, but in previous cases, when people do not list addresses on their questionnaires and it's a district where you must live in it to run, we have seen that that's, you know, usually they don't live in the district. So I want to ask you straight out, are you a, a resident of District 94? Do you do you live in this district? I do. I do. I live in a lot of the manners. OK, and you don't live anywhere else any other time of the year. This is this is your home. Yeah. OK, great. Like I said, I'm not I'm not, uh, you know, saying that that anything's you know nefarious about your questionnaire or anything but it's been our experience in the past that uh people that don't list their addresses there tends to be a reason why um 
Also, uh, uh, Mr. Eglishen and and Mr. Campbell, uh, under your endorsements, you both listed the the National Haitian American Elected Officials Network Progressive PAC. I wonder is that uh, is that a group that does multiple endorsements in the same race, or is there some confusion here? But there's no confusion. They're doing a co-endorsement. Okay, great. Thank you for clearing it up. That's that's all I have for now. Who does the Broward Teachers Union support in this race? Mr. Eglishan, do you know? <laughs> um, I, I believe, if, are they under the AFL-CIO? I think they are, yes. Then that would be me. <laughs> yes, I, I am um, endorsed by the union. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Mr. Manley, uh, do you support the legalization of recreational use of marijuana? And uh, if so, why? Yes, I do. Uh, I have been really supportive of legalizing marijuana for recreational use. Um, I think it has its benefits medicinally, but I also think it is uh, past time to legalize marijuana. It's been used as a catalyst for decades to attack black and brown communities. It's been used through the war on drugs uh, to attack our community. Um, but it also has a uh, really good economic potential as well. I mean, we see states all across this country um, experimenting with this and they're getting a lot of revenue in their states, but also uh, they're seeing a boom in their economy, in their economy from uh, marijuana. So I, I think pretty much everyone um, is almost on agreement on this issue. I see Republicans and Democrats who agree uh, that this shouldn't be a partisan issue, that this is the right thing to do. Mr. Campbell, do you agree with, uh, with legalizing recreational marijuana use? Yes, sir. I do agree with legalizing it, um, but I'm more on the stance of decriminalizing it um, as well. I think uh, it, it is it's definitely something that has effect with a, a black and brown community. And so uh, we want to be able to uh, put into put into effect that these th measures uh, pass um, criminalization of individuals that have gotten charges based off of their um, um, these small, small petty crimes um, that they are able to move forward and progress in their lives. And so uh, we having that hanging fruit of a conviction of marijuana charges is something that has been limiting a lot of individuals that look like me. And so I want to make sure that 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 gets addressed in the process of the legalization of marijuana. OK, Mr. Campbell, I want to stay with you for a second, but I'm going to change the subject matter to uh, voting and the election laws. I sure hope you all saw the stories the Sun Sentinel did about the fact that 286 ballots that were mailed before the election were not counted in the congressional race that Sheila McCormick won by five votes over Dale Holness. And uh, you don't need me to tell you this. There's the very real possibility that the race that you're in could be decided by five votes. If it happened once, why couldn't it happen again? Uh, I know that's not a very warm, fuzzy thought if you're a candidate out there working 18 hours a day and you're doing everything you can to win this race convincingly, which you should be doing, but um, it's it's out of your control. Um, and so, Mr. Campbell, what what are your thoughts? What should be done? What could be done in this state and in Broward County to make sure that these people who, in good faith, mail their vote in a week before the election, and it doesn't get to the elections office in time. Well, I, I think what we need to do first is make make a registration, make a lot of, of, of the, the policies in place a little bit easier for, for voters. Um, you know, going to the doors and, and listening to the issues of current voters, uh, a lot of them are are not even aware that a special election is going on. And so that's a that's a that's a problem. And so the fact that we're here sitting sitting during Christmas time where we should be having that with our families, we'll be here battling it out, trying to see who would be the next representative of, of a statement when we're um, when it should be focused on family, um, you know, being around our children, our 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 loved ones. And so um, I want want to make sure that we sh we make a, a send a message and and get the message out that our elections are important. And so keeping people well informed is what I've been doing and what I will continue to do um, by walking the doors and getting people out and getting people motivated to go ahead and vote. Mr. Eggleshot, I want to give you a chance to address that same question. What 
what ideas would you take to Tallahassee about making sure that no one gets disenfranchised in an election, especially a special election? Well, of course, um, we need to get the, the message out to vote, but I think we need to repeal this 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 voting act that they passed, and that needs to be the first thing. And I would say, thank goodness, and no disintent to our own election, but thank goodness this is happening now. So we can get this out now and get the rough edges out. So when it comes up and we have the gubernatorial race, which is very important, um, we need that in focus because there are some, when the general election comes, we need all these cringles and crinks smoothed out. We need to have this under control and done. And my, my, my vote will be to repeal this. And we definitely need to, as, as Daryl Campbell said, we need to get out and vote. We need to get the message out to these people that there is a special election. Because when I go and knock on the doors, they're asking, when is this election? Um, so we need to get the awareness out. We need to get people out to vote. And we need to send a message. Both parties need to send a message that uh, it's very important that we go and vote. Okay, yeah, I think the bill you're talking about repealing is the bill that, um, among other things, you have to renew your request for an absentee ballot much more frequently than you did before. I want to give very quickly Mr. Manley a chance to address the same question. What what are your thoughts about what needs to happen here? Yes, I thought a lot about that, and I am really interested in changing the law so that people who send their ballot in postmark before election day, even if that ballot doesn't get in exactly on 7 p.m. election day, it should still be counted because everyone did their part and the post office should not be deciding the elections in this country. It's not democratic. So I think we need to change that law. And that's something I'm extremely interested in pursuing if I'm in the state house. Okay. Martin Dykeman, go ahead. Turn your uh, mic on, Martin. I'd like to ask a question about, <clears throat> excuse me, the courts. Most of the judges who hear trials and deal with people on a daily basis, and all of the appeals court judges are appointed in Florida. Are you uh, satisfied with the way these appointments come about? And if not, what would you do to change them? Mr. Manley, you go first. Um, I do think the governor has made some good appointments to the courts. Um, I don't agree with all of them. Um, Obviously, you know, coming from a political standpoint, I would prefer people who share my political ideas. I'll be straight up honest about that. Um, but every governor has the right to appoint, with, you know, someone qualified to the courts. I do think the governor should be working more uh, with the bar instead of having, uh, instead of bypassing the bar, the bar association in their case. Um, so I'm not entirely satisfied with it, but I do share, uh, I, I do appreciate some of those appointments made by Governor DeSantis. Some of them have been very good people. Can you, uh, uh, be before we go to Mr. Eglishon, can you give us a specific, give us an example of somebody who he appointed who you think is a good appointment? I have to think on that. No, nobody from the Supreme Court for sure. I definitely think <laughs> that, that should he's, not be. He's, he's, he's appointed, a, probably, he's probably appointed four or five judges in Broward already, I would think. Yes, he has. He has yeah. appointed uh, four or five. Um, I, I, I do believe if he hasn't already made this uh, public, there was a judge in Broward um, who we just elected that he's uh, considering appointing to a to a higher court. I don't remember her name off the top of my head, um, but I think she was a pretty good choice for that seat. Okay. Mr. Reglishan, if you could um, address Mr. Dykeman's question. I would just have to agree with the process. Sometimes it's just the way the cookie crumbles. You know, if we had a Democratic uh, governor, I'm sure he would point someone that, you know, aligned with his issues. And unfortunately, we haven't had that. And that goes back to we have to have to just get out and vote and um, and get the person in charge to make those right decisions to appoint those that are best. But um, I do hope and think and would like to think that the governor is choosing these judges based off of merit experience as well as uh, as well as their, um, you know, their qualifications. OK, and Mr. Campbell. Can you repeat the question that you broke up while you were stating the question? Sure. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, uh, Mike's off. Most of the trial judges in Florida and all of the appellate judges are appointed 
uh, as a result of a process in which nominating commissions, I'll elaborate, I didn't go through this before, nominating commissions recommend to the governor. Are you satisfied with the way that is done? And if you're not satisfied, why not? <clears throat> No, I'm not satisfied because it um, when it, in doing a process like this, we we're we're what we're realizing is that the representation uh, within our courts, our judicial system, is not being reflected within our community. And so, um, you know, I know it's it's the process right now, but I would I would think of try to work with ways to that we can fix it. And so, um, as a legislator, I would try to figure out what are some things that we can do to implement it but if we had an infrastructure that represented our community uh the represented the the community that that um uh, that um is reflective of the individuals like uh, judicial judges i would be more for that um you know but what that looks like is something that i would need to do more research on and figuring out all right uh, i'm going to switch gears and i've got a question for mr manley Mr. Manley, if, if, you've, if you've read the Sun Sentinel editorial page once in the last uh, five years, you know that uh, we believe strongly that there is way too much money flowing through politics, and there's especially too much money in Tallahassee. And one of the reasons there's too much money in Tallahassee is because the law allows candidates like yourselves to have a, uh, a campaign committee, which is subject to the $3,000 uh, uh, limit. Um, Actually, it's a, it's a $1,000 limit, I'm sorry. And you can also have a political committee under your name or, or in your name that can uh, accept donations of any amount. And you've got a little account called the Friends of Elijah Manley. It hasn't raised much money. But why, but why Mr. Manley, just the concept, why is it necessary to have two fundraising vehicles? Yes. Uh, so first of all, I'll, I'll say that I believe that we should ban that practice. I don't think candidates um, should have PACs. Unfortunately, in the society that we live in, you know, money speaks in politics and it shouldn't. Um, we need major campaign finance reform and we should not have political committees spending tons of money in elections. Um, I know that there are a lot of people who believe that, uh, who believe the opposite, who believe that, you know, money is speech and corporations should be allowed to dump you know, millions of dollars into races and come in at the last minute, like what we saw in SD37 with FPL and other groups pouring money in um, behind the scenes to fund a scheme candidate, uh, which cost us a Democratic senator. And we've seen how that has, has played out. Um, I, I, I think that there needs to be major campaign finance reform here in the state of Florida. We need to do away with candidates um, having political committees. I never understood it myself. In my case, I created one. I had a couple uh, supporters who say, hey, I, I have 2,000, I'm, I'm going to give you another 1,000, and they gave it to my committee, and it kind of put me on a level playing field uh, during that time. Um, so I definitely think, you know, it's a practice we should do away with, we should have it, and I also support banning um, money from lobbyists and special interest groups to candidates and committees as well. I know that might seem a little bit too much, but I definitely think that is one of the ways we could um, protect our democracy from special interest groups. Well, why shouldn't... Uh why shouldn't a lobbyist be allowed to write a check to a uh, to a legislator or a legislative candidate? I think the problem, uh, there's two issues, one being a revolving door. And I also think uh, in many cases we see uh, people taking money from these special interest groups and then voting uh, voting for legislation from an industry um, that they receive money from. I mean, I know this is no stranger to anyone. I don't want to call it. I'm not going to call anybody out or any names of any uh, elected officials, but we've seen this in Tallahassee. We've seen this with Bit Sugar. We've seen this with FPL. We've seen this with other entities like Disney. So I think uh, the problem is that they're giving money and they're expecting something in return. And in Florida, we've we've seen this play out in both parties. Have you gotten any campaign contributions from Tallahassee lobbyists? I don't believe so. I don't think I would be the guy they would want to give their money to. Okay, uh, Mr. Eglison, uh, you too had a. Um had a piece, the uh, Joe Pack, and if I, I I looked I looked at the records that are available online. You opened it, you closed it, and you've you've opened it again. But when you closed it, um, you transferred about nineteen thousand dollars of a total of thirty thousand. You transferred about nineteen thousand dollars to a political committee controlled by Joe Casello, who is a House member from Palm Beach County. I want I want you to walk us through that transaction. Why did you make the tran transfer and why did you close it? 
Um, it was just something that was decided and collectively decided with my campaign team to do that. Um, and that's what we just decided to do. It was just um, one of those things. We open it up and after a while we thought about it and we just, you know, decided to close it and transfer it over. Can you, when, when, you're, when your political committee uh, got organized initially in, I think, 2018 or 2019, it, got, it, it reported two $15,000 donations. Those are significant contributions from two groups. Can you tell us who those groups were, were and, and who was behind them? Um, at this point, I have to look back at that, and I can get back with you with it. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with those who think that the proliferation of these political committees is bad for our system? I do not. I, I, I think that, if anything, maybe there should be some transparency when it comes to the PACs. But when I look at it overall, I think there needs to be some appeal or maybe reconstruction to the right in candidacy. So if anything, that's what I would change and make it more transparent. But I don't think there's anything wrong with having a PAC, um, just making it more transparent, perhaps. And I definitely feel a certain way about having a right in candidacy. Uh, I, I think that needs to be changed. Do you agree with Mr. Manley that uh, that it's a good idea to ban campaign contributions from lobbyists? Um, I do not. Why not? You know, sometimes you have the same interests as the pre the people that are the lobbyists are representing. So there's nothing wrong with them helping your efforts to you know get things done. You know, to run your campaigns, it costs a certain amount of money. And if you're on the same accord and your views align with what these lobbyists are trying to do, uh, what's wrong with that? I am in a healthcare profession. And if there is a lobbyist lobbying for something that I feel strong in and he wants to contribute to my campaign, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mr. Manley, briefly, go ahead. Not attacking Joe or anything. I think he's a really good guy. I, I just would like to say I disagree with uh, what he was saying. Um, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily, the issue is necessarily someone sharing the same interest. I think the issue is when there is an interest lobbying on behalf of something. Let's say I don't know anything about that interest or I don't have an opinion and I'm influencing my um, opinion on that issue. So I think there's a ton of ways to lobby without it necessarily being a cash contribution to a campaign. I think there are a number of ways to do that. There are other ways to show your support. It doesn't have to be a financial contribution. Go ahead, Martin. One of, excuse me. One of the big surprises I learned as a naive young reporter way back in Tallahassee, before some, before you were born, Mr. Manley, is that the um, lobbyists not not infrequently write the amendments that legislators submit on bills in committee and on the floor. If you were elected, and I address this question to all three of you, if you were elected, would you accept an amendment from a lobbyist and introduce it without running it by uh, the legislative bill drafting service? Absolutely not. I think I will be working with the Democratic caucus to write legislation. I don't think uh, if I don't understand the issue, I'll, I'll seek help. But that doesn't have to come from an outside group. I think I can adequately and eloquently uh, address what I want to see in law to the bill drafting service in the House and have them draft that legislation without it going through a lobby clearing house, a lobbying clearing house. Mr. Reglishan. Um, I think you definitely need to review what is written before you go and vote on it. Uh, I think that's just uh, uh, something that anybody that uh, wants to stay in office or have some sense and uh, any type of decency to their constituents. And I think they need to look at it and review it. Mr. Campbell, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I absolutely believe that, um, I, first off, I find that horrendous um, that, that uh, people do practice that act. Um, but at the same time, um, what I would say is for me, I would not put past legislation without looking at the bill. Um, I think for me is also being in, in tune with my, my constituents and actually knowing what the issues are. And so I want to know what are, are the, the, the good, what's the bad. I want to know both sides to an issue before I can even go at, go on the floor and actually debate it. And so um, I, I would definitely not pass anything. 
Um, I want to check with my team. I want to check with my 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 uh, my constituents. I want to check. I want to check. I want to check every avenue before going out. I want to be as firm and knowledgeable about what I'm presenting and what I'm fighting for. Um, Because the last thing I want to do is be uh, bamboozled as far as what's being placed for our community and what's and what's being focused on. Okay, I got to tell you that the three of us, Mr. Sweeney, Mr. Dykeman and I have watched a heck of a lot in Tallahassee over a very long period of time. And I'll just speak for myself. Uh, Too many legislators. They they change when they go to Tallahassee. They're not the same person. Uh, they their their ego gets out of control. Uh, they become obsessed with raising money. Uh, their family life may deteriorate. Uh, pe- some people are not emotionally equipped to, to be 500 miles from their family. And if you're from Broward County, like you guys are, you know you're a long way from home. Uh, and I and I I appreciate and respect the travel uh, challenges you're going to face. So, Mr. Eglishaw, I'll start with you. I mean, what what about your life? Forget politics for a moment. What about your life uh, reassures us that you're going to be the same person going out of Tallahassee as you are coming in? Well, this for me, I don't have to get my name out there. I, I kind of know what it's like um, <laughs> being in this for 30 years. I've seen the ups and downs. Um, I've developed a thick skin. Um, with my name being in the paper, both positive and negative, I, I understand what that's like. And not my name, but my surname, my father's name. Um, I understand, you know, it's the good and the bad. And with that being said, my family is also from uh, northern Florida, which is just outside of Tallahassee. So it won't be, it's, it's almost like a home away from home, but this is where my heart is and this is where a majority of my family is. But with that being said, knowing the ups and downs and the traps and, you know, being involved, because when you're in politics, it's not just you, it's your entire family that's involved. So with that being said, I'm not in it for, there's no money to be made. There's, I'm not in it to, to get my name out there or the clout. I think people who know me know that I'm not going to change. Um, and if anyone who knows me and it's been around, like Martin and, and yourself have been around politics, a lot of people would ask me why. And, you know, my thing is that when it's just kind of instilled in you, you've been around it, it's just something that you want to do. It's a passion when you see your family that has been leaders in this community and serving the public. It's just a part of you. It's just something that I, I, I yearn for. It's, it's, it's in me and it, it's, it's a fire in me that I cannot describe. I, I really care about this community. Um, there's a lack of leadership, and it's my time to step up and lead this community and to get things done. We need to do something and bring something tangible back to South Florida. We make up over 59%. South Florida makes up over 59% of the state's budget. And it's a shame that um, the last legislature hasn't done anything or brought anything tangible back. And we need to do that, and I want to do that, and I want to step up and to do that. And I'm not going to look at um, getting my name out there, getting my name in headlights, because I know the pitfalls that that can bring. I just want to get things done. I'm not caught up on party. I want to get things done. Okay. Why is there, very briefly, why is there a lack of leadership in the community, in your opinion? Well, I look what was going on and happened with COVID. I look and see what was going on with healthcare. And as I walk and knock on these doors, the people just felt like they were left behind. I, I, I love the leadership that was there ahead of us. Senator Thurston, he did a great job. I know Bobby DeBose well. We go all the way back to middle school. Um, but when it comes to the legislature and bringing things back tangible, I just felt like he left some things on the table and maybe have gotten caught up and and certain things in the limelight and get caught up into party. And that's something that I don't want to allocate or to play. I want to go up there. I'm a no nonsense guy. I want to get some things done and bring something tangible back to this district. South Florida is a beautiful community and we need to get some things done. It's time to get to work. We don't have time for eight years for someone to grow in this role. We need to get things done day one. Mr. Manley, uh, is Mr. Eggleston right? Lack of leadership in the black community? 
Yeah, I agree with that. And I think we saw that in uh, Congressional District 20, where everyone decided to run for Congress instead of sitting down at a table and saying, look, um, we all don't need to run for uh, run for Congress. I respect the democratic process. I respect that people have the right to do this, but it left a lot of our communities um, in, in the dirt, really. It, people vacated their seats. I had to fight and sue the governor to even get special elections for the seat. And that was an uphill battle. That was a fight. Um, and we're still, uh, we're still uh, seeing this fight out. Um, so there, there was a lot of lack of leadership in this community due to that. And we see this in many cases with this whole divide in our community, Jamaican versus black and Haitian and Caribbean versus them. And, and, it's, and it's unnecessary. Uh, we all live in the same community and we shall all be trying to build this community back better than it was before. And that takes all of us working together and putting the politics and the personal stuff to the side. And I think you asked another question as well at the beginning that I, I I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. OK, well, I'll, I'll get back to that. I'm sorry about that. Uh, let me just make the point that, uh, you know, uh, I remember a time in Broward County when you could count on one hand the number of black elected officials. OK, uh, Carlton Moore, Sylvia Portier. I knew Kathleen Wright, you know, who the school board is building is named after. And it's it's an interesting thing. It's a larger conversation for another time, but there are far more black elected officials than there have ever been in the history of Broward County, including most of the constitutional officers. And uh, it, this should not be a black and white issue, but let's be honest, it's a majority minority community now. And um, um, the next generation of strong leadership ha has to emerge. Um, Mr. Campbell, I want to ask you of the question I sort of asked Joe Eglishon, which is, um, it's important to not let Tallahassee change who you are. People, I'll be blunt, people are going to kiss your rear end and tell you how handsome you are. And if you just vote for this one little amendment, uh, it would be, really be great. So what what is it in your life that grounds you that you won't, Tallahassee won't change who you are? Uh, what's in my life that grounds me is my my passion for my family, my passion for my friends, and, and my passion for uh, counseling. Um, to this day, I'm counseling young black men that are struggling with mental health issues every day. And so seeing them reach out for help and actually find the strength to overcome their challenges of anxiety, depression, and suicide ideations is something that I I hold um, hold on my chest every every day I wake up. I, I think about ways to uh, how do I how do I help them in the long long game? How do I help find or help develop or guide them towards their path of, of success. And so this that is one of those, those are the things that I hold dear to me um, and I keep them close because um, I'm passionate about them. I'm passionate about my community and I'm passionate about uh, moving our leadership forward in the state. Mr. Manley, if you get elected to the Florida House, uh, I know you and, and the other candidates have talked about the need for more education funding and better health care and stuff. In a state the size of Florida, this stuff costs an astronomical amount of money. Are you willing to raise taxes to help those programs become reality? If we need to, I don't think we need to. I think we just need to reevaluate what our priorities are in this state, and we need to stop siphoning away our public dollars to private schools and charter schools. So that's a lot of funding right there that could go into uh, K to 12 education. And I also am a big proponent of funding for uh, universal uh, pre-K and early childhood education, which I think is not getting the attention and the funding that it deserves. I mean, the science is pretty clear to ages zero to five years are some of the most important years in a child's life uh, for development. I know I could have benefited from those dollars when I was growing up. I know that our community could benefit from that. I mean, just daycare alone. I mean, that's very expensive for parents, but also with just pre-K, we need to make that universal. And I know on a federal level, there there's already legislation to do that. But when those dollars come down to Tallahassee from the federal government, uh, we need someone there who will fight to get that funding down here to District 94 too in Broward County. And I think I'm the one to do that. Yeah, Mr. Eglison, um, you talked about, I think I'm paraphrasing, you talked about the need for to create tangible results and bring stuff home for the district. Uh, I'm just going to make an observation about how I see it, how things work in Tallahassee. The Republicans will let you do that, but you got to play ball with them on some other issues, okay? They control the budget, they've got the votes, they've got you over a barrel. So if you want to bring money home uh, to beautify the Cistron corridor, 
or to have uh, to expand an after school program at Dillard High School. I'm just thinking off the top of my head here. Um, then they'll find a way to help you do that as long as you play ball and vote for some of their stuff, including some stuff that's maybe not in the best interest of your constituents. So how do you balance those two? It's a hard thing to balance, but I think you have to look at certain things that don't hurt your district or your constituents in your district. And those things that I align with that may not particularly hurt my district, I would definitely work with the other side to get certain things done. Okay. Um, the legislature last year passed a bill dealing with something called home-based businesses. Uh, and some Democrats voted for it, including a few people in the Broward delegation. This is a law that makes it easier. This is, this is a bill that makes it easier to run a business out of your home, uh, even if City Hall doesn't agree. And maybe you saw, maybe you didn't see the news story recently that as a result of this bill passing, a guy in Lauderdale Lakes is selling ammunition out of his apartment. And Hazel Rogers in Lauderdale Lakes brought this to the attention of Broward legislators. That's one of a million examples of unintended consequences of things that happen in Tallahassee all the time. Um, Mr. Campbell, how would you resolve and, and reconcile being a true Democrat, but also realizing the Republicans hold all the cards in Tallahassee? Well, definitely is hearing that the issues are weighing the pros and cons to every situation. Of course, there's going to be outliers um, to to policies that are in place. And so, uh, you know, we need to pass certain things uh, such as home rules so that so so that um, these local um, cities can actually implement uh, certain things that can uh, uh, block uh, things from like this from occurring. And so, um, you know, I, I, I believe, you know, there, there are things that I, I know in Ocala, I will not know on a local level because that is not my, my area. And so we need to focus on allowing uh, these cities um, having more power and, 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 and putting in place uh, things that can actually block certain things. And of course, we would definitely revisit this and definitely close loopholes to policies that um, that others may abuse um, through through various wording. Okay. Mr. Eglishan, a, a biographical question. Um, you know, you're a, you're a well-known person in the community and you have a very well-known name, family name. I'm curious as to why you wouldn't have started out uh, running for municipal office, mayor, city commissioner, and so forth. It's just something that, um, you know, I, it, it just never came up. It's something that I never had interest in. And just as well as the other candidates, they've never, uh, you know, run for local office as well. So with me and, and, and understanding, I believe that sometimes you, you tend to step on some toes of some of the leaders that you've helped to get into place. And I have helped, uh, uh, for instance, Hazel Rogers. I've, I've, I've campaigned for her and my father has campaigned for her and a lot of these local officials, as well as uh, Mayor Ken Thurston, we have helped a lot of people get to that point. And at, at certain times, there's just certain lanes. And, and as I said earlier, uh, my political aspirations have always kind of been in the background and helping others, but this seat opened up and this was the time, this was the perfect seat for, uh, I felt to run for at the time for me and my family as well as the community uh, needed a leader to step up in this time with the uh, with Bobby stepping down and resigning. Um, it was time for me to step up. Yeah, OK. All right. Uh, re re real quick, just to just to clarify, uh, Mr. Eglish, you, you said uh, nobody else here has run for, for local office. Uh, Mr. Manley, you run for school board, right? Yes. Okay. That's correct. I just, just in case anybody else is watching this when we post this, I want to make sure that everything's you know, everything's accurate. Well, understood. I mean, as far as, um, you know, city, he's run for school board and several, you know, other positions. But when it comes down to, you know, city mayor, city council or city commission in that sense, that's what I'm sure. I, I totally understand what you were trying to say. OK, fair enough. Mr. Manley, what uh, what endorsement do you have that you're most proud of? 
Oh, that's a really good question. I have a ton of endorsements um, from elected officials and organizations. Um, I am going to definitely shout out uh, Fort Lauderdale Mayor Dean Trentalis. He has been an incredible mentor to me. I've known him for, for several years since I was about 14 years of age. I worked on three of his campaigns uh, as a volunteer, as a paid worker on his campaigns. Um, and he has allowed me to watch how the city is run and the way the city works and has always listened to me and given me advice uh, as to how to be a better leader, how to be a better candidate, and eventually how to be a, 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 an awesome legislator. So I, I'm very proud to have his endorsement because you know he's someone I look up to and he has always mentored me into um, understanding what, you know, listening to other people and understanding the other perspectives that are out there, even if I may not agree with them. So that, I think that is the endorsement I'm the most proud of. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the clock and I'm respectful. We're respectful of your time. And um, we also want to leave time for each of the three of you to make sort of a closing, closing argument, if you will, closing statement uh, as to why you think you're the best candidate in this race. Uh, it'll, it'll probably influence uh, our decision as to, you know, who we decide to endorse in this race. We really appreciate your participation. And so I want to start that now and we'll just go in reverse alphabetical order from where we began. And so we'll begin with you, Mr. Manley. Thank you again. Thank you all for having us here uh, to answer your questions. I think it's very important for us to talk about our plans and what we believe. You know, I am no stranger to this community, no stranger to any of you. I've been involved in the political and civic process since I was about 14 years of age. I uh, started by going to school board meetings when I was about 14 years old and people would look at me and say, who is this kid and what does he want? Um, and I was just very passionate about the political system like I've always been because I know how important these decisions are to our community and I know how they affect our community and because they've affected me. You know, growing up, I was chronically homeless, me and my family. We live, you know, in many cases out of a car, out of a storage facility. And I wake up every morning, it's still very hard to talk about. And I go to the beach before light, the light came out and I would shower and go to school every day like nothing was happening and I go and I, to get my education and just pretend like nothing was happening. And a lot of people didn't know about that. So I know how important these policy decisions and the people we send to Tallahassee affect our community. And I know that when I get there, I will remain uh, humble. And I know that I will think about the most marginalized and most affected people in our communities, the people who don't have a voice, the people who don't have anybody there speaking up for them, because there are, there, you know, this is a very diverse and vast community. There are a lot of people here with different ideas. Uh, but there are a lot of people in our community who just don't have a champion in Tallahassee to fight for them. You know, I've been involved for quite a while. I've learned, I've grown as a person. Um, I've learned the hard way in some cases on some things, um, you know, but I think politics is all about people. It's all about the impact. I'm not there for the title. I'm not there for the money. They don't make enough anyways. I'm there to do the work because I know that these decisions will affect other young people like myself. I don't want, you know, to see another child go, you know, grow up the way I grew up without uh, living in poverty without the tools and the resources they need to excel and to grow. So I think right now is a perfect opportunity for change, for something new, to try something different. Um, and if people don't like it, then <laughs> in just seven months, they can vote me out. Okay. Thank you for that very much. Uh, Mr. Eggleston, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Once again, I'd like to thank the Sun Sentinel and the editorial board for having me today. Um, out of all the candidates, I am the candidate with the most deep rooted roots in this community. Um, born in this district, um, my business is on this district. My father has served this district for over 30 years. My family has served this district. And as Steve mentioned earlier, some of our earlier leaders, Sylvia Portier and uh, Kathleen Wright, I've had the privilege of listening to them and knowing them and actually related to Sylvia Portier. So I was privileged to learn a lot from them. And as well as my father, I'm not going to shy away from that. I feel as if he was uh, uh, an astout leader and I felt like he did our community well. And I want to continue that legacy. And if the voters will have me January 11th, I will continue to serve this community and to bring something back tangible to District 94. I, um, I've owned and operated businesses. Um, I have my master's degree, I'm educated, and um, I'm ready to serve our community and ready to serve you and to do the community 
and serve us proud. January 11th, I hope that everyone votes for Josephus Eggleston. Thank All you. All right, thank you very much. Daryl Campbell, you have the last word, sir. Well, first off, I appreciate you having me and, uh, and reaching out to me and being on. I, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this um, part of this process, be um, fighting with three other uh, men that are also uh, trying to fight for this seat. But for me, um, it, it simply goes back to my 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 ability to uh, galvanize the community and be involved in the community. I, I served as a victim man before the state attorney's office. I, I'm, I'm a licensed clinical social worker that worked for the county um, for nonprofit. I worked for Henderson as an addiction therapist. And so I've been engulfed in community. I also worked for the current representative, Bobby DeBose, as his legislative assistant in this in this last session. And so for me, it's more of me walking in my purpose and walking in my light to uh, advocate on behalf of the community that I've been doing for so many years. And so um, I, I'm, I'm not looking back on the past. I know I'm not representative uh, co-leader Bobby DeBose. I know I am Daryl Campbell and I'm looking to uh, continue moving our leadership forward. I've, I've uh, learned from our leaders um, and, and this, in in my process, and in my process of learning, um, you know, it, it's gotten me to this state. Um, I'm always continuing to learn. That's why I'm currently in school at Howard University for my PhD in social work. And so I want to make sure that I'm adding adding that level of research component and data into whatever it is that I'm doing. I also have a private business that focuses on counseling individuals in our community currently. And so um, I want to continue being a voice for the community. And by being a voice of the community, um, that it's been me in the community actually listening to these issues and continuing to move that that uh, pendulum forward. And so um, for anybody that's listening, um, however this is posted, please go ahead and vote Daryl Campbell on your ballot because I will continue to move us forward. Okay, thanks, Daryl. And thanks to you, uh, Mr. Manley, Ms. Regulson. Thank you very much for being here today. Appreciate your participation and uh, the best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Happy holidays.